you. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizer for allowing me to present my research at uh, such a high profile venue. And uh, well, the ideas that I'm going to offer today are basically the necessary theoretical premise for my PhD dissertation. Um, I'm halfway in the writing up of my thesis, therefore I, I'd really be grateful for any remark, advice or suggestion that you want to offer. So, apologia. Apologia is a defensive speech in Greek rhetoric. So that's what I'm going to do today. Indeed, in the uh, most recent literature on time and temporality in archaeology, despite the abundance of divergent opinions in the discussion, one crucial matter seems to stand out as a common feeling. This is the need to go beyond chronology. Even scholars who recognize its essential role in archaeology tend to think of it as a linear, directional and homogenizer view of time and history, or at least as a set of practices and enabling such view. Now, now I took uh, one emblematic quote from a book that I actually like very much. <laughs> um, in order to illustrate this, appro this approach towards um, chronology, so that the um, adjectives that come up very often are uniform, linear, and directional. All right. So um, I believe that it is because of these criticisms that the literature on the theoretical and historical issues related to chronology and dating methods is very scarce. I can only I I could only find basically uh, Nash and a collective volume uh, edited by Nash in 2000 and a couple of volumes of Lumen and O'Brien. Uh, of course, with the exception of some volumes that actually tackle one specific dating method, normal, normally 14C or typology, or one chronological, particular chronological dispute. Um, however, um, the whole point of this speech, basically, um, is to argue that chronology is worth investigating precisely because it is an interpretive tool and not a descriptive one. In particular, I want to posit that it is a tool that goes beyond linearity, uniformity and directionality and that can be used to, pur to pursue different pur purposes. And these purposes can be unveiled studying how chronology has been used. So first of all, we try to offer a definition of chronology. It comes from the Greek chronos logos, of course, it means a discourse about time. So the Oxford Dictionary provides a narrower definition, the arrangement of events or dates in the order of their occurrence. I will now try and give my own definition, which should satisfy some conditions. First of all, it has to highlight the distinction between the concept of chronology and other adjacent notions, such as those of timeline and calendar. Secondly, it should not only relate to archaeology, but it shall be comprehensive of the many fields in which chronology has been and is used. When we use the word chronology, um, we normally mean one of two things, an orderly sequence of events or the discipline and methods used to build that sequence. In the first case, the notion of chronology has often been conflated with the one of timeline. The latter is a straight, directional, continuous line representing the flow of time where discrete events can find a place in a sequence. However, as Rosenberg and Grafton in their cartographies of time have shown, the timeline is actually a chronological notation, a, a visual notation of chronology. It is just one of many um, ways of visually representing chronological information. And actually, to my knowledge, a visual tool that was developed in the 1700s. Now, it is true that as Horst Bredekamp teaches us, images, mental or visual, can affect the notion they are meant to represent. So that timelines are such a common way to describe historical time that they have become part of our historical understanding, mostly through primary education. However, 
When we think about the ways in which chronological relation can be and have been represented over time, the difference between chronology and the timelines become, becomes apparent. Uh, see, here I chose the image of a phylogenetic tree representing um, all living and, ex and existing species. I chose it because it's rhizomatic, so it grows in all directions. Um, for um, the second, more practice-oriented uh, meaning of chronology, we must consider that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, we must consider that um, chronological methods st study time relations between two or more events. So, a chronological determination always concerns a relationship among multiple events in time. Even in absolute dating, what is being measured is the interval between the dated event and the moment of the measurement. Thus, chronology is not an intrinsic quality of the measured object. It is a tool to slice up time for explanatory and heuristic purposes. Now, in order to organize measured events in the in intuitive form of flowing time, we tend to embed them in shared conventional units, second hours, years, and calendars. <coughs> the latter, I believe, have been sometimes conflated with chronology, assuming that establishing the chronology of an event ultimately means placing it in a slot of the calendar. Even the chronology building relies on calendars in order to be understandable. One main distinction has to be made between chronology and calendars. First of all, the latter are inner conventions set up by societies as regulating tool for the present and a tidying tool for the past. The emic tools for time reckoning. On the contrary, chronologies are ethic tools of time reckoning. They extract events from their mar materiality, wood, bones, layers, chronicles and establish time relations between them regardless of their connection in the conscience of the society that produced them. So up, up to this point, we observe the many facets of, chronological, um, of chronology drawing the maybe confusing shape of what in the sociology of knowledge, specifically in the works of Wendy Griswold, um, would be called a boundary object which means a widespread concept which takes different forms in specific social contexts. But it is invariant enough to be always recognisable. The invariant characteristics of the concept should lead us in our definition effort so that we can refine our previous statement. So we can characterise chronology as a twofold notion. On the one side, it is a textual or visual representation of temporal relations between events, and on the other side, it designates the disciplines and methods used to obtain that representation. So, in order to understand the weight of chronology on historical disciplines, it is crucial to investigate how it relates to different notions of time. It has been argued, for example, by Handy White, that chronology is a function Hayden White, I'm sorry, um, that chronology is a function of a teleological vision of history, a residue of modernist idea on progress and evolution. I contend, however, that as a boundary object and a constructed tool, chronology can respond to different concepts of historical time and can adapt to different epistemological approaches. So in my dissertation, I try to show how this is true for both sides of this bifacial concept of chronology. Uh, both dating methods and practice, and chronology as a representational tool. So I, I um, talked about the first facet um, of, of this uh, twofold notion this morning at the my chemical romance se session. Uh, here, here, I'll try and give you a quick glance at the second ones. Um, Let's use the characteristics of chronology that I have presented as the, um, at the beginning of this talk as being the features that are uh, often associated with, with chronology in the literature. So let's start with linearity. Henri Bergson, in Essai sur les données immédiates de la conscience, points out that pure duration can only be experienced in a non-mediated way. As soon as time is conceptualized, it needs to be translated into space, either physically or mentally. Therefore, chronology that is one tool to conceptualize time needs to be spatial, and it can very often be visualized as a line. However, it is not necessarily one line, nor it is 
um, necessarily straight. So I'll bring one example. This is the table that closes Charles Renouvier's philo philosophical novel, Euchronie. He was a Neo-Kantian philosopher uh, working in the second half of the 19th century. He was a pupil of August Comte, interesting, interestingly, but unlike him, he denied historical determinism. This is why, in 1876, he wrote a fictional history or historical utopia in order to show how some crucial decision could have, an, uh, an could have changed human history. In order to visualize this, he produces a graph where real events are uppercase letters and fictional projections are lowercase letters. They take the form of a complex and random ratification, and even that, he states, is an oversimplification that reduces the multiplicity of historical processes to binary decisions. The second aspect we are going to discuss is directionality, which is the idea that chronology aligns events in a row, all flowing in one direction. It is true that all systematic ordering of events, be it an, in an A series or a B series, has to be directional in the sense that something that has happened cannot hap un happen, at least conceptually, but this is a good time to quote um, the paper of Lucas on the reversibility of material time. However, uh, chronological representations in archaeology are mostly bidirectional, some of them are indeed proceeding from the past to the present, trying to explain the development of a society or a phenomenon. But a lot of archaeological narrative, especially on time and on chronology, they are what Rosemary Joyce calls tales of origins, which search for the roots of some contemporary phenomenon in the past, going basically the other way around, from the present, from the present to the past. Moreover, while teleology does require events to be chronologically order, ordered, so yeah, chronology enables teleology, um, directionality does not necessarily equal <coughs> teleology, and I give one example of that as well. Um, the question Rignacienne, the Rignacian disputes, is a long standing chronological problem that originated in France at the beginning of the 19th century. Louis de Mortier refused to believe that um, Aurignacian assemblages were earlier than Solutrean ones on the base of an idea of incremental complexity of human societies. The Abbé de Bray, on the contrary, used stratigraphic data in a chronological arrangement to argue for the earlier date of the Aurignacian, of course, in the sequence, but more interestingly, against the idea of a continuous and incremental development of society, arguing for a more individualized path or better idiosyncratic character for each society. Finally, I conclude. Um, some thoughts might be offered on the issue of time, of, of time uniformity as it is embedded in chronological representations. Indeed, as chronology is a tool that connects events in time and measures their distance on an interval or ordinal scale, it does exploit the principle of the infinite divisibility of time. However, this does not mean that it requires time or change in time to be treated as continuous or ho nor homogeneous. And by continuous and homogeneous, I mean um, a sequence, sequential in the process of change. Um, so about that, I'll give one last example uh, that concludes this communication. It is the work of Wilhelm Pinter, a German art historian who wrote in 1926 <laughs> Das Problem der Generation in der Kunstgeschichte Europas, uh, where the concept of the non-contemporaneity of the contemporary was introduced, uh, to my knowledge, for the first time, um, his main tenet is that at a certain moment, in, at a certain moment in, in time, several generations operate in a world that is simultaneously contemporary and non-contemporary to them. Therefore, at a certain moment in time, different, si different competing artistic styles corresponding to different generation, the generations would coexist in a thick temporal sequence where there are no neat period boundaries and transitions are made of overlapping durations. 